Today's episode of Terror at Collinwood features a conversation with the delightful Elena Nicanther. But before we get to that, I want to let you know about a couple of ways that you can help the podcast. First of all, if you subscribe via Apple Podcasts, please make sure to rate and also drop a review if you get a chance, even if it's one sentence, two sentences, a few words, please drop a review over at Apple Podcasts. If you're uh, listening on YouTube or watching on YouTube, please do drop a like and subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. For this particular episode, um, there are some amazing photographs that Elena sent to me at the studio in the 60s, in the 70s. Great stuff. Another way you can help the podcast is by sharing it, letting your friends know about it, sharing it via social media, uh, or sharing it to your friends group, sharing it in groups, horror groups, 60s nostalgic groups, or just word of mouth. If you have friends who like Dark Shadows or like classic horror, things like that, let them know about the podcast because that does help the podcast to reach more fans because this is all about celebrating Dark Shadows, keeping Dark Shadows alive and undead in 2023 and going into 2024 and beyond. And lastly, uh, a lot of people have asked me about ways to support the podcast financially uh, via Patreon. I don't have a Patreon account yet. I might start one. I haven't decided yet. But I do have a Buy Me a Coffee page, which I have retitled Buy Me a Coffin. And you can find that at buymeacoffee.com, all one word, forward slash terror at Collinwood. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, If you care to donate to the podcast, that does help with the cost of hosting the podcast over at Squarespace. That also does help with the editing software that I use. I use the Adobe Suite, um, which I do pay monthly for that. Uh, But no pressure, but uh, it does certainly help the podcast out. And I want to thank a few people who have already done so. Brenda S., Frank, and Joni Page Bryan, thank you so much for your support of Terror at Collinwood. And now let's get to the show. Welcome to Terror at Collinwood. I am your hostess, Danielle, aka Penny Dreadful. And my guest today is going to blow your socks off with the story she's going to tell you. Uh, it is Elena Nicanther, who is a lifelong New Yorker who worked for many years as a music director and producer on New York radio in the city's number one market. She's one of the fabled studio kids who hung out uh, at the ABC Studio 16 uh, and soon thereafter became Jonathan Frid's personal assistant during the run of the show. The two remained close for the rest of Jonathan's life, and she has so many great stories for us today. Welcome to the show, Elena. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you having me on. Oh my goodness, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Uh, I've heard your name many times over the years and I've seen you, you know, mentioned in the fanzines and um, I know you had a piece in um, Our Shadowed Past, uh, the, the first volume of Our Shadowed Past. There's a new book coming out. Bob Issel is doing volume two of that. So uh, I'm looking forward to that as well. But um, talk to us a little bit about how how did you first discover Dark Shadows? You were a kid at the time, right? Yeah, I was. Um, actually, when Dark Shadows first came on in 1966, I was so disgusted that that show was coming on and taking over uh, the time slot of Never Too Young, which my, was my favorite soap opera at the time. With Tony Dow, and right, I from gave, Leave It to Beaver, right? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I watched it for about a week, and I was so bored with it. It was like, oh, God, this is not good. This this and not replace what I, I'm missing now, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I didn't give it another thought until this one day, uh, one of my schoolmates, Roxanne, she said to me, said, oh, let's go shopping after school today, you know? So I said, okay, let's go. So we, we went to our house and she said, well, we're not going to leave until after I see my, my soap opera. And when I saw it was Dark Shadows, I was like, oh, no, you got to be kidding me. But 
Jonathan came on the screen and I was mesmerized by him from the first moment that I laid eyes on him. It was immediate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we watched the whole show and at the end she was going to turn it off. I said, no, no, no. I have to see the credits. I got to know who that actor is. So I found out it's Jonathan Frigg. And I turned to Roxanne and I said, I am going to meet that man. Roxanne thought I was out of my mind. She thought <laughs> I was absolutely crazy. She said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I said, I, I'm going to meet him. I told her. And it took me time because my parents wouldn't allow me to go on the train by myself. But in the meantime, I saw him at the Brooklyn Academy of Music when he was the MC of a fashion show for A&S department stores because my uncle worked for A&S and got me a VIP pass. VIP pass. Mm -hmm. And um, so I got to see him, but the bad part was, yeah, in 1968, I met him. I wasn't allowed to talk to him. Oh. You, you could go backstage, you can watch everything, but you can't talk to him. Mm -hmm. What good is that? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it took me another year till 1969 when my Aunt Esther, God love her, she broke down and said, okay, I'll take you to the studio. And wouldn't you know it, the first day that I went to the studio, Jonathan wasn't there. Oh. But, but what happened was a mother and daughter were there who lived near my Aunt Esther. Mm -hmm. And bingo, I had someone to go to the studio with. So that's how it all started. Nancy Driscoll and I, we go to the studio together in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it took me another time when I got there to meet Jonathan. And he was fascinated by my red scrapbook. Yeah. I had this big red scrapbook that had all sorts of articles and pictures of him that I had collected from magazines and all, all this stuff that I, I found on, you know, all over the place. And he wanted to see it. Mm -hmm. So he invited me into the studio so that he could, as he put it, peruse it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that was the word. <laughs> so... <laughs> anyway, he started looking at it there and, you know, it was getting late. So he said, why don't we go out for a bite to eat? So we finished perusing the scrapbook over dinner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, me being a teenage girl who was at that time 16, mm -hmm. I'm saying to myself, what am I going to talk to this man about? I have no idea. I didn't have to worry about it because he just kept on talking. So it was, it was great. You know, he would ask questions. I'd answer them. But mainly, he would just go on and on and on. So it was terrific. <laughs> and it came, it came to the point that he really, he really liked talking to me. And, you know, I'll skip some time. Uh, he, he wanted to have his fan mail answered. This is what started the whole thing. And we started talking about it. And at that time, I said I'd help him answer the, the fan mail, you know. And he said to me, do you have anybody that you know who could help you so that you have a partner in this? And I met Valerie, who was another girl who went to the studio. And Valerie became, as I put it, my partner in crime. She and I did everything together. And we became, in quotes, Jonathan's girls. Right. The Frid and girls, we, right? The Frid girls? Yeah. I remember. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've heard that phrase over the year, the Frid girls. So that was that was you and Valerie then. Yeah. <laughs> so any anyway, so we we would answer his mail. We would go get ma the magazines on Wednesdays at Grand Central, so that he would have everything that was written about him, mm -hmm. and he'd get to see it. And we did all that. But the fan mail parties, the the real big fan mail meetings did not begin until a year later because of other commitment. Mm -hmm. He thought he was going to just have us have these big meetings and, and have all the fan mail answered. No, but he had so many promotional junkets to go on 
And then with the filming of the movie of House of Dark Shadows, it was pushed back. And the first fan mail party didn't happen until August 15th of 1970. Yeah, so it was a it was a while before that happened then. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you you said that I was his personal assistant. I never got paid. Valerie never got paid. This mm-hmm. was all just because we admired and liked Jonathan. Right. We did the stuff for him. This was strictly, you know, for the perks that you got, you know, sure. getting, going to the studio, going on the sets and everything. And the one thing I have to tell you. As far as going on the set, mm-hmm. Valerie and I went on the set exactly once oh. because neither one of us, neither one of us even cared about it. Uh-huh. All we cared about was taking care of what we had to do for Jonathan. Mm-hmm. And he insisted on, on this one day that we go on to the set and he took pictures of us in Collinwood. <laughs> so I have a couple of pictures of, of Valerie and I on the set of Collinwood. Oh, yeah. And uh, just for the audio listeners of this episode, if you jump on over to YouTube, Elena was kind enough to send quite a number of photographs uh, of her uh, experiences at at the studio and with Jonathan um, over the years. So uh, they're well worth taking a look at if you go to the YouTube version of this episode. Um, Elena, so you you were you went on to the to the set uh, for that one day, but I want to ask you a couple of questions about that. First of all, what was the experience like outside the studio uh, on a day? Did you go like every day, or was it once a week that you would go? And what was that like being at the studio uh, during the height of Dark Shadows? Okay, um, I learned that the security guard at Dark Shadows, George, mm-hmm. uh, he he had the schedule of when the actors would come in. And this was in the beginning when I first started going there. And I would ask him when Jonathan was going to be in. This was before everything happened. And so I would only be there on days that Jonathan would be there. There was no reason to go if he wasn't, as far as I was concerned. That, But outside the studio, it depended on the day. Mm-hmm. There could be 10, 20 kids out there or there could be hundreds. Wow. Depending. Mm-hmm. The, the summertime was outrageous. Yeah. People would be out there from the morning till the night mm-hmm. out, out in front of the studio. And and Christmas vacation, Easter vacation, the same thing. It got to the point where Jonathan uh, had to go out the back door. <laughs> and that worked for a while until the kids got smart enough to know he was going out the back. Yeah. And that's when Valerie and I would have to create a diversion so that he could get out of the studio. We would come to the front and all the kids would come to the front thinking, seeing us, that he was going to come out. Mm-hmm. And he figured it out a lot of the back. <laughs> <laughs> so they all knew that you were, so they all knew that you were uh, Jonathan's uh, I don't know, assistants then. So they right. kept an eye on what you were doing. I see. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> It's very clever, very clever. I saw you sent me some pictures, you know, of uh, of Jonathan, you know, in costume coming out um, to to greet yeah. the kids and stuff. So they must they must have had a fun time with that too uh, during downtime. Maybe sometimes coming out and uh, just for the to give the kids a thrill and come come outside. I would imagine. Yeah, well, Jonathan told the story, and I'm sure a lot of people have heard it of him coming out in costume and acting like the kids outside screaming at them and waving and everything and all these kids fanning out into the middle of the street wow yes on 53rd street (laughs) between 9th and 10th avenue and his comment was but they all survived (laughs) (laughs) i laughed when he said that i was like oh my god (laughs) it was very funny that was very funny coming and yelling out the door you know Right, right, right. <laughs> um, when you uh, brought your scrapbook to the studio, that I've seen, you know, pictures of it, and of course, you were also in um, Dark Shadows and Beyond, the Jonathan Frid story, directed by Mary O'Leary, who was the one who who connected us, which uh, I really appreciate. So thanks to Mary for that, and you were great in uh, in Mary's documentary about Jonathan Frid. But you had this uh, scrapbook 
now with the articles, you were, uh, Dark Shadows was huge with teenagers during that time, not only kids, but also teenagers. And so you had a lot of, uh, were you like a, a collecting articles from like what, 16 Magazine and Tiger Beat and stuff like that? Yeah, but also there were there were articles in the New York Times. Okay. There yeah. were articles in um, TV Guide, mm-hmm. and the most most strange article was that it was in um, a fashion magazine, a a journal. I can't remember the name of it right now, mm-hmm. but and we had a hunt for this in the garment district to get it. <laughs> so yeah, wow. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It was all over. It it was mess. And not to mention the, the monster magazines. Yeah. Too. yeah. Mm-hmm. It was. Yeah. It was really something else. Right. Uh, but you would never know it. it. Talking to him and being with him, you would never know that he was a big celebrity mm-hmm. ever. Yeah, he seemed very humble. Jonathan. Yeah, exactly. And I can't tell you how much he helped a lot of kids. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of these kids that came to the studio, I have to believe because I was one of them was shy Mm -hmm. uh didn't really have a lot of friends uh had broken homes Mm -hmm. you know I mean and they had a lot of problems but Jonathan was so kind and so respectful to these children and teenagers that I think it made a big difference in their lives I know that it did in mine yeah do you want to talk a little bit about that uh, you've expressed that Jonathan was a, a big inspiration to you in your career. So would, could you elaborate on that? Yes. Well, when I started going to the studio, I was interested in becoming an actress. I really was. Mm-hmm. And I was in drama club and I did the things in high school and all of that. But I really wasn't that sure of myself. I didn't have the confidence to really put myself out there and Jonathan said to me, and I said this in Mary's documentary, yeah. that he believed in me. And in believing him, I believed in myself. And that's what made me become the success that I was mm-hmm. in radio. And I, yeah. I could never thank him for having that kind of lease in me. He, he just inspired me to do my best and that I could do whatever I put my mind to and it was incredible that man had such an influence over people that I think it helped a lot of kids yeah. not just me and you had you had a very successful career in radio for over two decades and as, as I recall and you brought you brought Jonathan on to the radio station a few times right yes <laughs> I had him on on super sales show that I, I wow. produced Back in the 80s, yeah, in the 80s. Yeah. Um, it was funny. Uh, I went to a convention that they were having in some hotel. It must have been one of the first ones that they had, like in 84 or 85 or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I said to him, I said, I'm going to be starting work on Soupy Sales Show on WNBC Radio. So I said, I want to have you on the show. So he said to me, he said, Oh, that'd be great. Really great. So uh, that started me having him on the shows was when I first got my first job in radio. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, wow. I continued. I had him on the Alan Combs show and then I had him on the Dolan show, all these places that I worked. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Any time that I could, that, that he was promoting something. Yeah. And you were, you remained close with, with Jonathan for, through his, through his life, right? You remained at stayed in touch with yes. him, right? Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Cause you oh, sent yes, me some coming, pictures of him through the, through the years with you and him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's coming upon the anniversary of the last time I saw him, August 22nd, 2011. Mm-hmm. And I think Jonathan knew that that would probably be the last time that he ever saw me. Because we were standing in the lobby and his uh, webmaster, Mark, who accompanied him uh, on the trip Mm -hmm. to the convention in Brooklyn in 2011, I I went over to him and I said, please give me a call when you get Jonathan to his condo so that I know that you got there okay and he's safe. And Jonathan 
walked over and he heard me say that to Mark and he came over, he put his arms around me and kissed me on the lips. That's my last memory of him in person. Yeah. And I, at that time, I mean, that whole weekend, all I did was really cry because I had a feeling that that was going to be the last time that I ever saw him. Yeah. Because from the, from the year before in 2010, when I saw him in LA, the change in him was incredible to me. Yeah. Uh, and I, I just knew. And it made me very sad. Yeah, it's I, it's really sad. And it's, but it's a, in a way, it's also a, like a beautiful goodbye too that he gave you, you know. Um, but I'm so yeah. sorry because, you know, for many of us, we're, you know, we're fans of his performance. I got to meet him once. Um, I saw him twice, but I, I didn't get to meet him the second time. The first time I met him at Fools and Fiends and he was so gracious and so nice, but you had a personal relationship with him. He was your friend, you know? Um, yeah. and, uh, so, and over the years, you know, you've, you've stuck with him for, for so many decades. It's wonderful. Um, I'm glad you did get to see him in 2011 because he wasn't, he wasn't doing a whole, he did the, he did go fly out to uh, England to go do the Tim Burton film, uh, such as it was. But... Yeah, that was, that was very hard on him. Oh, I'm sure it Extremely. was. Extremely. Uh, first of all, he was given very little time to when he was going to fly out there. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, Mark couldn't go with him. So it wound up that Jim Pearson went with him, you know, to yeah. England. And the 20 hour travel really did him in. Yeah. I mean, he was exhausted. It was to the point that after he recorded that scene, he took a nighttime flight out of, of London and his nephew picked him up at the airport in Toronto at two o'clock in the morning. Wow. I mean, it, it, it was horrible. Yeah. It was too much for him. Really yeah. too much for him. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot to put on him. And it was only for a, a few seconds seen in the, in the film too, which is odd. You would think if they brought those actors all the way out there for the original actors to be in the movie, they'd give them a little more of a substantial, you know, scene in the film. But I'm sure Jonathan was pretty wiped out even when he showed up on the set probably yeah. to film that. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, listening to David Selby talk about it, that all they did was sit in a dressing room mm -hmm. and that David was so upset about Jonathan that all he did was watch out for him the whole time. Yeah. Like if he had to step off a curb or whatever, he was holding on to him. Sure. And yeah. he, it was just too much. Yeah. That's. Yeah. But I want to I want to jump back to you mentioned a couple of things that I want to touch on, too. And some of the pictures okay. you sent me too, I want to ask about. So um, just jumping back to that day that uh, you went on to the sets to to see um, the sets, what was that like to actually experience that, to be uh, in the studio on and seeing, being on the Collinwood set? It was exciting. You know, I mean, to actually go on the set, sit on the couch, stand by the curtains, mm -hmm. uh, it just, it made it all so real. Yeah. Because those sets, uh, the, the Collinwood set and the old house set were permanent sets. Mm -hmm. So they were bigger than the other ones. Mm -hmm. and they were there and they were actually life size, as I put it. You know, they look like a room. Uh, whereas the others were just these little cubicle things mm -hmm. uh, that were Put, pushed in and out as needed so it was a very small space that they had to work with and that's why a lot of the times you saw the cameras mm -hmm. go in to the scenes because yeah. the cameras didn't have enough room to turn around but the Collinwood set was beautiful I mean it looked like a, a, a living room in a mansion it really did it, it really looked real you yeah. know because it was and now, the old house the same way, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, were you there while, when, was this in between, uh, like after the day's uh, uh, taping was over or or was it uh, in between during a break or? 
this was during during a break at 11 o'clock in the morning when they had their break. Okay. And Jonathan decided to bring us down and just take a few pictures of us on the sets. Did you get to interact with any of the other cast or crew members that were there? Uh, we did from time to time, but for the most part, when we were there, Valerie and I would be in Jonathan's dressing room just working. Mm -hmm. And really, I didn't want to interfere with their work schedule. I mm -hmm. felt that we were here to do something for Jonathan and not to be socializing or trying to get pictures of other actors. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But very professional. Even at, you know, as teenage fans of the show, you were very professional yeah. during that time. But you um you are were also uh, fans of, of the show itself. So were you did you were you able to watch it on the days that you were down there? That was there a way to be, for you to be able to watch the show? Sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't. It depended mm -hmm. on what we were doing mm -hmm. because they did have a TV where they played the show. Mm -hmm. And if Jonathan was watching it, we'd watch it with him. Uh -huh. But if he wasn't in it, obviously we weren't watching it. That must have been was, surreal you know, watching Dark Shadows with Jonathan Fred uh, and his yeah. reaction. I'm sure his reactions were entertaining to certain things too. <laughs> When he'd watch well, it. all I can all I can say is if you're watching the show with him and he's on, do not even think about talking to him. <laughs> <laughs> he's stud he's I mean, studying he's his performance. Silence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you also liked uh, Grayson Hall a lot too. You you uh, you had mentioned. Did you um? And you had a great story about uh, going to see her in a, in a play. Can you talk about that? Yes. Grayson was wonderful. I loved Grayson. She was so funny all the time. And mm -hmm. she helped Jonathan a lot. A lot of times he would go to dinner at her house so that they could go over lines. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just was a, a really sweet person. And we found out that a bunch of studio kids found out that she was going to be in an off-Broadway show. Mm -hmm. So we decided that one night we were all going to get tickets for the first row and fill it up so that when the lights went on at the end of the show, she would see all of us. Mm -hmm. We did that. And when the lights went up and she saw all of us sitting there applauding her, she just broke down in tears. She really did because mm -hmm. she was so impressed that we we actually felt that way about her to actually go out of our way and buy tickets to a an off Broadway show to see her. Yeah, yeah. So, so this was a bunch yeah. of the studio kids that just got together yeah. and said, "Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. What a great it story." Was. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Um, you when you were working for doing work for Jonathan, like you mentioned the, the fan mail parties, which you sent me some pictures of. There's, a, there's also, there are also a few other pictures in the mix there too. Um, the Christmas party, 1968, um, uh, 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 the uh, uh, House of Dark Shadows, when he came back to the show, you had a, a welcome back cake for him. So it's not, it right. looks like, there was like a lot of really cool stuff. How did he react to things like that? Well, the Christmas party in, in 1969, it was, Oh, 69. Party. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and he's, he's holding the Barnabas Collins game. <laughs> yeah. He was, look, he was looking at his watch because he had to make sure that he wasn't late to be on the Tonight Show, which was still oh. in New York at that time. Yeah. So that's why he was looking at his watch. Wow. And we all went to the ton Valerie, Kathy, Nancy Driscoll, and I all went to the tonight show with Jonathan and wow. saw him on the tonight show. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. Cause that footage doesn't exist anymore with Jonathan on no. the tonight show or Lara Parker too. She was on it twice. I think. Um, wow. That's really cool. What was the tonight show experience like? Well, it, it was, it was in Rockefeller center mm -hmm. and you went up in, in the elevator and it went into this big studio and you sat, it looked like a movie theater that you were sitting in and the, the uh, stage was down below and mm -hmm. it was like um, stadium seats where it went up as you went in. And uh, so we just sat there and watched it. 
and then after it was over, we left. You know, I mean, it was it wasn't like it was anything I could tell you about except watching the show because yeah. really it was just the show, and that's oh, it. it. Was it was it was uh, Carson uh, Johnny Carson? Hope, no, it wasn't. Oh, it was- no, it was um, a substitute. It was Awesome Bean. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it was it was Christmas, like uh, it was December twenty third, so it was Christmas break. Mm-hmm. So Johnny Carson had off, and they had guest hosts. Okay, it's a it's a shame that those uh, episodes of the the Tonight Show were taped over. I believe uh, a lot yeah, of they the- were. I can tell you that for sure, because I worked at WNBC Radio, Mm -hmm. and that was one of the first things I did was go up to the tape library, Mm -hmm. because I wanted to see if I could get a copy of the tape of of Jonathan on The Tonight Show, and I was told that those shows were taped over. Oh, what a shame. What what a shame, yeah, Yeah. because I know know, uh, Lara Parker tells a story about biting uh, Johnny Carson with the she was during the time when she was playing Angelique the vampire, and she had the fangs and she was bit <laughs> Johnny Carson pretended to pass out and stuff. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, but but I have to tell you, I have I used to record his interviews on my little Concord cassette recorder, mm-hmm. and I actually have the audio of that interview oh you do oh wow Mm -hmm. have you ever released that I gave it to him I I gave him a whole a whole um cd of of different interviews that I had that I recorded off the tv oh that's great I know a lot of those have kind of made their way into the the fandom yeah I've heard a bunch of of different ones uh, I don't know yeah. if I've heard that particular one, but I've I've heard a bunch of different ones with, with him and other cast members that have kind of found their way. Uh, but yeah, stuff like that, uh, I think that definitely needs to be archived and preserved, you know, so that people can can enjoy it. Um, that's great that you were, you thought to record that stuff and that you would cut out the articles and all of those things. Um, mm-hmm. What about the... Uh, your graduation, Jonathan, uh, did Jonathan came to your graduation or? No, he didn't come to my graduation. What happened was I had a little dog that was a, one of those autograph graduation dogs mm-hmm. that, the, that people would sign. Okay. And I brought it to the, I brought it to the studio for him to sign. Mm-hmm. And what he did was he wrote Barnabas on it and he said, well, now your dog has a name. <laughs> So he named your okay. graduation dog <laughs> Barnabas. I love it. Oh, I love it. That's great. Oh, that's great. Oh, there's also pictures yeah. of Jonathan kissing the Hallmark squirrel. What's that all about? Okay. Valerie and I had, had we, we love to go to Hallmark stores all the time because we got cool cards there. And we saw this little squirrel statue that said, I love you on it. <laughs> oh. And since it was going to be the first fan mail party, mm-hmm. we decided that we were going to give it to Jonathan as a remembrance of the first fan mail party. Okay. So that's why he's kissing that that squirrel because <laughs> we gave him that statue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. No, the fan mail party that must have been. I mean, he received such an immense amount of fan mail that must have been. A challenge to to go through all of that stuff and you didn't want you to read it right because there was sometimes personal right. stuff in there and stuff right yeah oh man <laughs> that that was I, I mean he would police at those fan mail parties he would police the kids don't you look at that because well no, people would just, send in some pretty weird stuff like you know <laughs> to him sometimes you know well so. I could tell you one that I saw that he he yelled at me for for reading I said but I said, how could I not? It's on <laughs> black paper with blood red ink. And this 31-year-old woman actually believes you're a vampire. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, it's a little scary that, you know, there are some people that uh, there's the line between reality and fantasy is very blurred. Or, yeah, or some. exactly. So, so, yeah. There's also one you said um, that with the... Uh, my love for you is a what a poem or something? Oh, it, we 
we, like I told you, we used to go to card stores all the time Mm -hmm. and there was an Ajax commercial. My Uh love for you is stronger than dirt was the tagline of that Ajax commercial. And this card had that in it. And Valerie and I thought that was the funniest thing (laughs) and that we should give it to him. And as you could see in the, in the picture, if you know, you're looking on YouTube, you will see the picture of him holding that card and he has this grin on his face. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. And yeah. it looks, and there's another one you sent with Mac, the McMaster sweatshirts. Oh yeah. Um, he graduated from McMaster's in Ontario mm-hmm. and Valerie and I decided we were going to call the bookstore of McMaster's and see if we could get sweatshirts to surprise him and wear them to the studio. Uh-huh. And we did. And there's a picture of us wearing the McMaster's sweatshirts with him standing between us. Oh, he must have loved and that I, when you showed up with those. He did. He did. He couldn't believe that we got those sweatshirts. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I still have the sweatshirt. Oh, cool. Oh, that's great that you kept those. I love that. Wow. Yeah, because um, the only time we wo- I wore it anyway was that one time, and then I put it in a plastic bag and put it uh, away. Oh, that's great! Cool. Uh, yeah. there, now you, uh, so you remained, uh, you know, the Frid girls through the run of the show, right up until the very end, right? Right. Um, because I saw you, you know, you sent some pictures where where he has the Bramwell hair. Uh, from, right, right. From the end of the series, and I, I want to kind of address this because, um. I have heard from, you know, over the years, fans have always said, oh, Jonathan Frid uh, insisted he wanted to play a different character because everybody else got to play some. But I heard, you know, from more inside sources, I guess, that it was actually Dan Curtis's idea to have Bramwell as a character in the 1841 parallel time uh, storyline and all of that to create a new character for Jonathan. And I'm sure Jonathan enjoyed the opportunity to play a new character for sure. But uh, as I understand it, it wasn't Jonathan's idea. It was Dan Curtis's idea for this to happen. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Um, It all happened because Jonathan did not want to do a second movie. Yeah. And Dan said to him, if you don't want to play Barnabas in a second movie, obviously you don't want to play it on the show. Mm -hmm. So he was phasing the character of Barnabas out. And he actually, Jonathan was supposed to end Barnabas in January sometime of 71. Mm -hmm. And then we got the word that the show was going to end and the Bramwell character was created. And he played Bramwell from January to, I guess, March it was, that they they taped the last show. I think it was March 24th was the last show that was Mm -hmm. taped. Mm -hmm. And he played Bramwell. And what was strange about the whole thing is that once that Bramwell story started, the ratings shot up immensely. People loved Bramwell. And who could not love Bramwell? I mean, really. That had to be the most handsome character ever. <laughs> that that hair. Oh, my the, God. The hair. The hair is definitely something else. It's a different. It's definitely a different character from very different from Barnabas. Much more. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Very, very different. Um, But you can see in like December uh, where there you can tell something's going on there because Barnabas kind of disappears from the show for a while professor stokes comes in like he's going to kind of take over this you know trying to figure out the the whole drew to zachary thing but then barnabas comes back um so some something was obviously going on there and dan curtis uh all the cool things he did he was definitely known for his uh, also for his temper so so i'm sure he was not thrilled that jonathan didn't want to do the second movie so there was a lot going on there i like to think that if the show hadn't ended that um that things would have cooled down and that Barnabas would have come back on because that's just insane the idea of getting rid of Barnabas the star of the show is just bananas like that'd be like <laughs> I know it's, it's just cutting off your nose to spite your face kind of because you get you're exactly, getting rid of the star yeah, attraction yeah. of your program there um but mm-hmm. 
but by then they knew the show was going to be canceled. It was, it was Dan Curtis's um, idea there. Yeah. How about um, after uh, the show ended um were I mean that every all the you, I mean everybody must have been pretty sad like were you part of the protests to kind of keep dark shadows on the air at oh, that yeah. time mm-hmm. if you look in the documentary I am up on top of the ABC cube holding <laughs> the sign <laughs> I was like the leader of the pack <laughs> oh awesome good <laughs> It's kind of crazy. Yeah, it's crazy that they canceled it because it was it was still pretty popular. I mean, uh, I think Dan Curtis wanted to go make movies is what what it is. You know, he wanted to go out to Hollywood. I've heard that quite a bunch of times. And I'm sure everybody was burned, burned out, too, because that's such an intense doing that for five years, uh, you know, every day, five days a week must have been an intense Mm -hmm. for everybody. But there's more to it than the ratings. Like you said, the ratings were going back up again. Um, and they weren't all that bad to, I don't think, to begin with. Although during that right. time, too, um, you know, the the younger demographic, a lot, a lot of kids and teenagers were watching Dark Shadows. I don't think the, the, the network cared as much about the kid audience, which now is hugely important. But I don't know if they, the network itself cared as much about the kid audience back then. Well, what I think really happened was that at that time, it was when they were doing away with cigarette commercials Mm -hmm. and that was a big part of the income Mm -hmm. was those commercials. So it it was a couple of things. Dan Curtis didn't want to continue. He really didn't. Mm -hmm. And the cigarette commercials going away made it less profitable. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's how it goes in showbiz, you know? Right, right, right. But, uh, you know, much, much like the characters uh, in Dark Shadows, they never die, they always come back. So uh, Dark Shadows continued on in syndication and through oh, yeah. a, a very active fan community and passionate fan community that continues to this very day. So did you, I mean, as one of the studio kids who was there at the epicenter of this and beyond even studio kid and helping Jonathan directly, um, uh, you know, did you continue on as a fan in in the fan community and participating in any of that? Well, I I went to some festivals uh, and, you know, I supported him anytime that he was doing something. Like when he was doing his library readings, Mm -hmm. I would go to as many as I could. And then I would have him on my radio shows promoting his readings or anything that he was doing, the festivals, whatever. But uh, I had, you know, in the 80s, I started having my own career and I didn't have a lot of time Mm -hmm. because when you work in radio, you're working every shift, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if they need someone to fill in, you don't say no because they'll boot you out the door, you, you, you know don't uh, perform you know so and being a newcomer at that time I had to take whatever they gave me you know right right but you know I never lost track of Jonathan ever and I think that the funniest story is uh in 1982 uh WNBC TV was going to run Dark Shadows again for the first time and he was going to appear at Live at Five, which was a new show on, on Channel 4 TV in New York. And Valerie and I found out about it from a promo the day before that he was going to be on the following day. And we went to Rockefeller Center and we, we stood out near the uh, entrance to the uh, elevators waiting for him to come down. And when he saw us, it was unbelievable his face <laughs> you have to see his face and he, the first thing he says to me he says Elaine why didn't you come up to the green room and I looked at him I said Jonathan it's not in 1980s now they don't allow people to do that anymore mm-hmm. it's not like it was before <laughs> where you could just go come and go as you please you know <laughs> right 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 yeah <laughs> did, did you stay in touch with the with the uh, other studio kids too um like I know you're still close with Valerie right 
Yeah, I'm still close with Valerie, uh, Jay Nash, mm -hmm. Walter Miller, Kathy Colby. And I'm, a, I, you know, I'm still friends on Facebook with like Rich Levantino, mm -hmm. who was part of the Studio Kids. Yeah. So, you know, I kept in touch with the ones that I was the closest to, basically. I'm sure you all kind of share that bond of having that experience. Which oh, is yeah. So cool. Yeah. yeah. Like every time I talk to uh, one of them, you know, Valerie and I and, and are, are the closest mm -hmm. because we shared everything. But, you know, I do talk to Jay and Walter a lot. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Kathy Colby, I talk to a lot also. But every time that I talk to Jay or, or Walter, it's like it's like we were back at the studio again. Like time never even passed. Right. We could just go back to talking as if we talked yesterday about 50 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Really. That's so cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. My uh, my friend Bill, I mentioned to you when we talked before. My friend Bill used to go with his sister Nancy, but I don't think they were like regulars. I think they would go once in a while. But he's um, he sent me a couple of pictures before, and I I want to get him on the podcast at some point to talk about uh, his experience as well. But um, there there was one there was one other set of pictures you sent me here. A meeting for Jonathan's journal. What's that all about? He's wearing his eighteen forty outfit in the in the picture. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh we were up in the studio and we were having a meeting for Jonathan's journal, which never came into fruition because of the cancellation of dark shadows. Oh, okay. Uh, Jonathan had decided that he wanted to do a monthly newsletter mm -hmm. that he was, he, we were going to put together and we were Valerie and I and Kathy were on the committee to do this. And, and Walter also, uh, we, we were on the committee to do this and we, we were formulating what we were going to do to present the journal. The first copy was only going to be four pages long because Jonathan was going to pay for it before there was going to be a paid subscription. Mm -hmm. And so we were talking about that and he was in his, his costume because he had a plane to catch. Uh, right after the meeting so what he was going to do is change into his street clothes and run out to the car as soon as <laughs> the meeting was over yeah so <laughs> that's why he was in his oh i see clothes. okay i see I was, I, yeah I was, <laughs> what's going on here uh, yeah very cool very interesting well um mm -hmm. are there any other memories that jump out that you would like to share with with the fans about jonathan or your experience uh, being at the studio, being Jonathan's assistant, any anything come to mind? I think I think the greatest thing was going up to Tarrytown, really. Oh, for House and, of Dark Shadows. Yeah, for House of Dark Shadows, and seeing him and Grayson and Louis Edmonds in their costumes, mm -hmm. and having them pose for pictures, and it was just such a thrill to be up there and be able to pose with the police cars and at Rose Cottage, and just kind of have the run of the place to take pictures of everything and and just enjoy being up there I, I I thought that was a very special time and the other thing I can think of is uh, murder in the cathedral oh yeah uh, right after you know it was he was doing it while dark shadows was ending and that was what really kept us busy and not thinking too much about the end, Valerie and I, because we were too busy working on being ushers and helping Jonathan uh, with murder in the cathedral that we didn't even, we weren't even thinking about the, the show ending. As a matter of fact, we didn't even stay for the rap party. Jonathan I was going to ask you either. about that. Yeah, Jonathan couldn't go because of, he was in murder no. in the cathedral. So you you didn't, you, yeah, you didn't make leave. Yeah. So you didn't yeah. make it to the rap party then? No. No. We okay. we left. I mean, to me, it didn't matter. The rap party didn't matter. If he wasn't going to be there, why would I want to be at the rap party? You know, yeah. that's just how it was. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. That's that's so. dedica dedication for a Yeah. I mean, because uh, I know a lot of the actors who had been on the show previously came back to 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 attend that, but it's unfortunate that Jonathan couldn't make it, but he was in a show uh, at the time. So uh, it's definitely, you know, understandable. Um, yeah. Is there anything you want fans to 
know about your time being with him and how he, you talked a lot about how he treated the fans and how kind he was to them. Um, is that the main takeaway here? Yeah, he mm -hmm. was very kind and generous with his time with the fans. He really was. He signed countless autographs and he posed for many pictures. And I know how tired he was, mm -hmm. especially on, on days when he was working for the fourth day in a row at the studio. Mm -hmm. I knew how exhausted he was, but he never let it interfere with his being kind and generous and giving to his fans. And all I can say is he was a really wonderful man. I, I can't say enough about his character. He just gave of himself and gave of himself. And I miss him. That's all I can tell you. I really do. You've been very giving of yourself, uh, too, in this uh, in this discussion, in this interview. So I want to thank you, Elena, for taking the time to uh, sit down with me today and uh, share your memories of Jonathan Frid, being one of the Frid girls, uh, and also of... Um, just of your time uh, as a studio kid and being being there and in, in that experience this was like i mean it was like the beatles i mean it was really just unbelievable how popular dark shadows was it was a huge thing and you were right there for it uh, at the time you right. know and a lot of fans got involved in the fandom after and they did become friends with the actors and and got to you know be involved with the fandom but you were there right from the from the get-go when this was going on so that's that's pretty pretty amazing on uh, that you were part of that that's a very special thing yes <laughs> it was <laughs> all right elena well thank you very much for joining me uh and folks if you were listening to this on audio uh jump on over to youtube and check out the video version of this so you can check out these great pictures that elena uh sent to me because they're they're sensational and you also run a, a facebook group right elena can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I run Jonathan Frid Treasures Group. And on it each day, I will give a little story of what happened that day, either at the studio or on the show, so that people could see what went on. And also, I go all the way up to 2011. Uh, like this week, I'm focusing on the 2011 uh, festival because I have little stories from that festival that was Jonathan's last. I saw you posted about the um, 2007 festival, and I commented on that because I was at that one. And uh, Larry Storch mm -hmm. went up on stage, and they had done Arsenic and Old Lace together. So that was really that was a surprise for uh, Jonathan Frid to see uh, Larry Storch show up there. So that was really quite a, a special moment there too yeah it was it was and I love that he walked out onto the stage that was the first festival he had done in a, quite a while he had taken a break for a while and yeah walked out with the Barnabas cane like like he was pretended he needed the cane to walk onto the stage and then he started twirling it like he was, <laughs> like he was yeah, doing yeah. A show. it was great yeah and the audience went <laughs> I know. bananas I wild. mean wild they blew the roof off that place it was like just the yeah. The admiration and, and love and enthusiasm from that audience was, uh, words cannot convey what that was like. It was really cool. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I mean, I hadn't seen Jonathan in person. I mean, I talked to him, but I hadn't seen him in person since 2001 at that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, he had a little party uh, at the beginning of the festival, and I was there, and, and uh, as a matter of fact, the picture on my Facebook uh, page, my my personal page, the cover picture is a picture of us seeing each other for the first time at that 2007 festival, which is a great picture. Yes. And uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, well. Elena, thank you again uh, for sharing these uh, wonderful memories with us. Uh, I know the fans are going to love hearing from you. Uh, and uh, I will definitely put a link to uh, the Facebook group, to the Jonathan Fred Treasures Facebook group in the show notes. So if you are on Facebook, you can uh, definitely check it out. I encourage you to because there's some really great stuff in there. I was going through it just the other day. 
And uh, Elena, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it very much. My pleasure. And for as long as they lived, the dark shadows never truly vanished, for there will always be Terror at Collinwood. Terror at Collinwood is a Penny Dreadful production.